You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. As we follow Jesus' life in Matthew, we've witnessed claims that, if true, would send shockwaves throughout the world. Jesus claimed, I am the bread of life. I am the living water. I am the vine. I am gentle and lowly. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I and the Father are one. And after being put to death, the reality of an empty tomb legitimizing every claim he made confirms an earth-shaking truth. This changes everything. Anybody meet their wife through church? Anybody? Anybody? Praise the Lord. Connections are made with the people of God, and here's why. And this is the title of my message this morning. Relationship changes everything. It's really important the relationships we foster and the relationships we have. It's really important. Would you agree with that? Would you say, yeah, relationship changes everything. But could we also be honest this morning and say, well, that sounds good. Are there not relationships that have maybe changed some things for us in ways that are hurt and pain and loss? And so we've got to look at God's word and say, God, what do you say? What do you have? And so my goal today is that God would breathe resurrection life through relationship into this body and beyond. And I'm already noticing I have a natural inclination to go this way. So somebody must be in trouble over here. I don't know why. Or I'm just more of a right than a left guy. I don't know what's going on. So uh, what I'd like to start with is just if we could engage, if you have the, your Bible this morning and you want to open, I am New American Standard, and I think it's like 1995 to be specific. So I heard you guys are English Standard Version. It's okay. You're still going to get to heaven. It's not a problem. Um, but Matthew 28, starting in verse 16, is where I'm going to read. And what I would love for us to do, and I know this, this may be uh, familiar for some, maybe not for others, would you stand while we just read God's word and declare it this morning. And if you are not able to stand, that is totally fine. Just stay seated and receive it. So this is Matthew 28. I'm going to go to the left this time. Verse 16. But the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some were doubtful. Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. I want to start by saying I'm honored. I'm honored um, that I'm trusted with the pulpit this morning. Um, and and I, I, as I've already shared gratitude with you, I'm also aware that this church has shown to me, from being a young man growing up in this community to today, that the leadership of this church has remained faithful and that there has been a call on this church to make disciples. I've seen that. I've witnessed it. So, as we're looking at God's word, I want to set up 
a lens for us to look through. Now, I have an argument from the text. I want to be very clear that I'm going to miss some things. So if we have some Bible students here today, see me after class. Because I'm going to miss some things. We're not going to have time to get into every nuance and every, every item. But I really believe there is a word that's present for God's people today. That if we receive it, there's restoration in it. And there's also inspiration in it. To go and be what God is calling us to go and be. So let's define a few terms this morning. The first one is relationship, right? We hear that word. Well, relationship is the state of being connected, literally meaning to relate to a person or a thing. And when you are in relationship, you are connected in such a way that you are bonded. You are not separated. I know uh, growing up I would say, oh, I have these friends, I have those friends. But if I was honest, I knew a lot of people, but I did not have connected relationship with a lot of people. Maybe I would connect in some way saying, oh, I played sports with that person, or oh, I saw that person at church. But to be honest, connection, where I learned connection and relationship, was as a brother and as a son, as a husband, even as a co-worker at a workplace where I had a work relationship. And so sometimes if we're not careful, we can throw out the word relationship and not know that there's actually a specific meaning to it. Who are you connected to? Who are you connected with? And who's connected to you? Because it's mutual. It's not just, yeah, I got a relationship with so-and-so, but it's actually agreed upon and mutual, connected. It's an important lens this morning. So we're going to throw up, uh, these are my seven healthy traits of a relationship. Um, we're going to start with number one. And if you want to take notes, you can, because um, they're going to they're gonna come and go. But I, I'm going to tell you, this won't be as important as what's after this. So if you just want to listen to it, listen to it. If you're a note taker, take notes. Number one. The number one healthy trait, can I get an amen? Clear communication that has been confirmed, right? Can you hear me now? Number two, active listening. Has anyone heard that term? Active listening. Someone is engaging with you with eye contact, with body language. They're in your space and you are heard. How many times... Have maybe you spoke and you're like, man, I don't think anybody heard me. Anybody? That's me. A lot. Just ask my wife. Number three. Intentional trust that has been built. You ever have that question asked, hey, do you trust me? Do you trust me? Hey, do you trust me with this? Well, this is intentional trust that's actually been built. It's fortified. Where I see this most is typically in a healthy marriage where a husband and wife are able to communicate in and out of tension, friction, different levels of, of stress. And you can just see there's like, a, like, no, I'm with you on this. I'm with you on this. I got it. You might hear the, I got it, babe. I'm with you. Yeah. And you see this like intentional trust that's built. Important. Number four. The men should amen this. Mutual respect. That there's a mutual respect. How many men, if we're honest, and I'm not going to make you raise your hand, but I'll raise my hand. How many times have you worked with another man that you did not mutually respect? Maybe even worked for a man that you didn't mutually respect. And how did that relationship end up? If there wasn't a mutual honoring from man to man. Number six. Or I'm sorry, number five, thank you. <laughs> Open honesty, invulnerability. You can ask my wife, I can be really open and honest and share a lot, but that doesn't mean I'm gonna get vulnerable and actually get to a place where I'm really sharing what's going on. Number six, safe space for processing feelings. Now the women should go amen. Safe space 
to process how you are feeling. You ever hear that saying, was it feelings don't matter, right? Or, or facts don't care about your feelings? Well, we know that's not true according to God's word. We were created to feel, to empathize, to have sense. And so there needs to be safe space for processing feelings. And finally, number seven, clarified and enjoyed intimacy. Now, a lot of people probably hear that word and go right to, oh, like a husband and wife. Actually, intimacy is actually considered in Scripture the deepest bond of friendship. You know who showed great intimacy in the Old Testament? Two men, David and Jonathan. There was a great bond of connection and relationship between these two men. That it says David loved the time he spent with Jonathan more than the time he could spend with a woman. What? That's wild. Right? Nobody? Nobody thinks that's wild? Well, the scripture says this. But it's not talking about just the intimacy of marriage, but that there is a love. There is a love deep from our God that we can share in deep with one another. So let's go to the other side of that. Here's the unhealthy relationship traits. Number one, only communicating what one wants to or has to. I guess, I guess, I'll, I guess I'll say it if I have to. Number two, my wife's going to yell amen. Here we go. Listening with an opinion or an answer in mind. That's me. Number three, using trust as leverage for control. That's an ouch. I know I've done that. Well, I really want you to trust me because I'm really actually trying to control the outcome here. I'm really trying to get my want. Number four, respecting only what is considered worth respecting subjectively. I'll respect you if I think it's worth it. I could honor you. Yeah, I could. I see some similarities there. Number five, honest, and this one's hard, honest when it is a benefit for self-enrichment. Oh, I'll be honest here if it'll help me in the deal a little bit. Oh, yeah, 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 I can, I can, I can go a little step further here because it's actually going to be for my benefit here. So I'll, I'll, I'll share that detail. Number six, Space for feelings to be shared and pity shown, but not received in empathy and embrace. Yeah, you can, oh man, that's, whew, that really stinks for you, man. That sounds horrible what you're going through. Hey, see you Tuesday. Has anyone ever been on the other end of that? You've opened up, you've shared, and you're like, man, they had pity on me, but this, this heaviness Felt like it didn't go anywhere, like it was almost pushed right back in me. Finally, selfish and self seeking intimacy without a mutual goal or unity at all in mind. What's in it for me? What do I get out of this friendship? Anybody have friendships like that? Intimate friendships where it's like, oh, yeah, we can hang out as long as we're getting this done. One of my favorite lines uh, growing up as a, a carpenter's son is, ah, I know a guy. I know a guy I can call to help me with that. So, yeah, we're buddies. I know a guy. And if I fix his boat, he'll help me fix my deck. And, we'll, and I go, okay, is that intimacy? Not that we can't serve one another. But, man, if we're honest, is there maybe something missing? Like, how are you dealing with that? How's things going with that? Instead of, like, hey, you, help, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. So now I know you may or may not agree with that list. You may add to it. You may take away from it. My point in sharing those lists with you is not to go, okay, now we've got it. That's not God's word. That's just some ideas and some perspective. But here's what I want to get at. How I relate with my wife, my children, 
my world, my past, my present, and my future matters. And here's the big point that I hope you get as we dive in. God's relationship with us changes everything. Because there is not one unhealthy relationship trait within our God. There is nothing but healthy, life-giving, resurrecting life in Jesus Christ. Amen? So now let's, let's go back to the text starting in 16, and we're going to try to move through this as quickly as we can. I got the opportunity to listen to the Easter Sunday message, and what I heard was the evidence is undisputable, right? No matter where you sit, the evidence is undisputable. Then I heard Matthew Jacobs share that there was a burning from the word of God coming from Jesus on the road to Emmaus. And I think the question he asked was like, hey, when you hear God's word, are you like burning? And, and here's, what I, here's what I am to say. Okay, we have the undisputable evidence. Okay, God's word is burning. Are you willing? Are you willing to take a risk called faith and say, I want a relationship with Jesus Christ? Because it changes everything. And if I'm already in a relationship with Jesus Christ, maybe it looks like repentance today. And turning back to God and saying, God, I have been hiding, but I love you. And I want to walk in right relationship with you. So here it is, verse 16. But the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. And if you know the text or study the scriptures, Mount Olivet or the Mount of Olives, Jesus previously designates. There's some excitement going on. People are seeing the resurrection. There's, there's women that are getting to share the news. There's men that maybe, maybe they felt like they were on the, the outside or on, on to the left or the right of things. And here they're getting a chance to share that, hey, Jesus has resurrected these guys on the road to Emmaus. Hey, we saw Jesus. And he's going, look, okay, I need some intimacy with you. The 11 of you, meet me in Galilee at the Mount of Olives where I've designated because we are going to have a relational exchange. Here's the thing that we need to get right off the bat. The disciples, we're going to see in the next verse, some things they're struggling with. But don't miss this. They obeyed God and they went to the mountain. And I'm going to come back to that towards the end. Verse 17, when they saw him, they, what did they do? They worshiped. That sounds good, but some were doubtful. Here, the disciples See Jesus, and here's how I picture it. Here's Jesus on the mountain. Now, I don't know about you. I don't know how good your eyes are, but I'm thinking like if I see somebody and I'm like, okay, I recognize them. Is it 25 feet? Is it 50 feet? At what point do I go, oh, that's so-and-so, you know? So here they are saying they see Jesus and they worship. Well, the word worship here is proskuneo, which is physically to show honor, to literally be prostrate before God, maybe even to raise hands or bow a head, it's to show honor. So they, that, that's Jesus, and they start to show honor. But some are doubtful, and depending on where you stand on this with Bible scholars, some would say this doubt is previous doubt. When I look at the text and just say, let's go with what we have, but some were doubtful. And Matthew doesn't point out who. So at the very least, there's doubt to some extent that needs to be dealt with. And in, in Mark's gospel, you actually see that Jesus, there's a word used, he rebukes their lack of belief or their doubt. But the word doubt here or doubtful here only comes up in the scriptures twice. And it's actually, uh, I'm going I'm to butcher this, so I'm just going to go with the meaning instead of the word. Uh, it actually means to hesitate. This type of doubt. 
So what I'm getting from this is Matthew is writing this and he goes, some go right into proskuneo, some go right into, we got to honor him, and some go, should we? I, I guess we will. Do you see that happening? Some engaging right away and some going, I don't know. Is that, is it him? Is that a ghost? Is this a dream? And and, uh, to give more clarification, the word doubted is literally to waver. And another place we see that is in James when it says, don't be tossed to and fro like the waves. Don't waver. Well, being doubtful here, there is a proskuneo, there's an active outward worship going on, but there's also an inward mental wavering that's coming out in hesitation. I, I, don't, I don't know. Verse 18, Jesus, this is what I love. So here's, whatever the gap is, let's say it's 50 feet, what does Jesus do? And Jesus came up and spoke. Our God is a God of relationship. He didn't stay off as they were worshiping him and doubting and saying, all right, I'm going to shout to you. But instead, he comes up to them intimately and he sa- it says he speaks to them. Not he speaks over them. He speaks about them. He speaks in hopes they're listening. But I'm imagining Jesus making eye contact, having the, the proper, healthy body language, looking and being able to listen and know that there's doubts. And he speaks right to the 11. This is the God we serve. An intimate, loving God of relationship. So Jesus closes the gap. And then he moves into his command. But before that, verse 19, before the command, famous, these are famous words in the church, right? The Great Commission Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Has anyone ever gotten that as like the Christian rah-rah speech? Let's go! Anybody? Well, there's more going on there. So actually, go, therefore is a participle, it's not, it's not, go therefore is not the command. Go therefore actually is better translated as you are already going. Or be as you already are. He's speaking to disciples in the midst of worship and doubt and he's saying as you are in your doubt. This is how I'm going to send you out, with a command. And here's the command. Make disciples. Now, we don't have time to get into it and cross-reference and move around, but I will say this. You cannot make disciples without a relationship with Jesus Christ. You cannot. You'll, you'll, You'll make disciples, but not of Jesus Christ. Disciple is just a student of a teacher There's plenty of teachers and students. In fact, I don't even want to get into it, but if we were to look at social media, we've got a bunch of interesting teaching going on in our world that's coming from all kinds of places of mostly people that are like TikTok theologians. They've got some ideas about God, and then they run with their feelings, and they run with their experiences, and they don't have the humility to sit under a rabbi. And actually humble themselves under the teaching of God's word. Instead, they put themselves over God's word and talk about God's word like they can say exactly what it means and everything they know. And then put their agenda and their ideas fed into who God is. And and to be honest, it's heresy. It's absolutely against the construct of making disciples biblically. And it's more of an idea of getting a following. Here's Jesus with 11 on the mountain. Not 11,000. How many followers do I have? How many people can we get to this event? Jesus is going, I just need you 11 to come meet me here where I can be intimate and in a healthy relationship with you. I need to draw close to you and I need to speak to you and I need to call you to what's next. Do you guys see that? The beauty in that? 
totally against what the American church, if I can say this, or the American infused idea of church is selling. Let's get bigger. Let's get better. Who can we reach? And, and, and for me, I, I love being in this country, but I have gotten some messages that are very confusing from American church. Instead of biblically, what is God saying? What is he calling us to? Well, you're not going to get a lot of people doing that. Okay? Is that the goal? Well, I mean, you know, good-looking people tithe better. Don't you know that? Well, where would you come up with that idea? Well, they got money. They're taking care of themselves. They, but I thought it says no partiality. I thought the last were going to be first. Why, why are we putting the best-looking people always up in front? What are we doing here? And these questions surrounding my mind. And here, here, I see people worshiping in doubt that don't look so good. This does not look like the best bumper video for the next church event. Men hesitating to worship God in the presence of God. And he's saying, go. As you are already going. Let's, let's move on. Are you with me this morning, Mission Point? So, make disciples is an interesting term there, but it's actually to craft. So, we have some craftsmen here that craft and like to make things, work with their hands. So, to make disciples also means to get dirty. It means to actually be involved in the process. Not, guys, when we're done the message today, go tell people about Jesus. See ya. But instead... Walking in relationship with people and saying, hey, here's, here's how I've shepherded my home and here's how I've formed God in my home. And then a brother coming along and saying, man, I, I want to I mirror that and I, I want to I bring discipleship into my home. And, and now we see like people diligently working at a potter's wheel, just crafting and making. He goes, you're not doing much. It's not exciting. What are you doing, making pottery? No, I'm... I'm I'm making a family that honors God. Uh, I'm, I'm crafting uh, a daughter and sons that would follow God with their whole heart. Well, that, that's not exciting. Come on, man. We got fantasy draft tonight. You got to forget about that. Hey, actually, I, I need to spend time with my wife. She's going through some things, and I need to be present for her. And it, and it, and it looks like making disciples for me. It's not glamorous but it's glorifying to God to make disciples. And anybody who's a craftsman knows the last thing you need is a bunch of busy noise when you're trying to make a straight cut and someone talking to you. You go, hey, hey, I, I'm so sorry. You can't talk to me right now. I need to cut this straight. There is also a safety involved with making disciples and saying, hey, it looks the way God said it. I'm sorry, we can't mix that in here. That's not gonna work. We have to make them and craft them the way God has called us to do. So the next word here, um, as it says, make disciples, baptize them, right? It says, of all nations. This is the word ethnos, where we get the word ethnicity, but it also could be translated literally as tribe. Your tribe. Okay, well, I know right now I have a tribe. I have three little ones and uh, one on the way, and I have a tribe. But there's a temptation to say, well, I really want to gravitate maybe more towards being an Eagles fan. I want to gravitate more towards these guys I hang out with at the gym. And while I'm not saying being an Eagles fan is bad, go Eagles. What I am saying is men in our generation are being made into disciples, are being crafted and formed into images of this world and not the image of Christ. It's not popular opinion to be formed into the image of Christ. It is popular opinion to be formed in what an American man looks like. And I'm, I'm sorry to tell you, American men are going to die and pass away. But Jesus Christ, his name lives forever. And so to craft and make in the image of God is the best. 
It's the best. It's not glamorous, once again, church, but it is glorifying to God. So here we are, uh, verse 20. Here's the relationship. I love he draws near to them, and then he ends with this. And lo, I am with you. Even to the end of the age. And it actually says there the word always, I am with you always, is literally translated all days. So at any point in the day where you think God isn't present, he's actually saying, I am with you at every part of the day. You will forget. You will be doubtful. But I will be faithful at every part of the day, all the days of your life. And I will usher you in to dwell in my house. The end of the age. So we're not going to have time to go into depth any farther than that. But I want to circle back. And I have three takeaways for you. And so verses 16 and 18 is where we're going to set up shop. Here's point number one. Obedience is a right relationship. You've got to get that. Remember the disciples obeyed and went to the place where Jesus told them. One thing they learned as they were being crafted by our Savior for three years of discipleship was to take him at his word no matter how they felt, but to obey. Number two, take away, doubts are not to override obedience. When it comes to our Lord and what he has commanded, doubts are not to override obedience. And finally, obey as you are going. Obey, don't, don't make obedience, when I finally can obey God, then I'll have arrived. But instead, how do I obey God in this moment is what the text is really saying. Obey as you are going. So let's handle point one. These, these disciples are post-resurrection disciples. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine following Jesus, then everybody scattering like sheep, and now they're seeing a resurrected Lord? This is tremendous, but at the same time, can we be honest? Is anybody going to be doubtful? I think it's going to be me. I really do. I'm speculative. Well, was it really him? Did you really see him? Are you sure? I don't know. So they've battled their doubts. But Jesus said what? Meet me in Galilee. And they obeyed. So here it is. This is Romans 1.5. It tells us, Through him we have received grace and apostleship to, the call, to call all Gentiles to obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. Now, here the Apostle Paul is communicating that the call to follow God starts with what? Obeying God. Obeying God. And that only can come from faith. Your ability to obey in God this morning is because he is the resurrected Lord of your life and he calls you to obey. He says, follow me. Was that not his first call to his disciples? Come, follow me. The answer is yes, Lord. Jesus said in John 15, 14, you are my friends. You have that intimacy. If you do what I command. You want intimacy with God? I know I do. We have to do what he commands, which means we have to know his word. My example of this is my son. I love my son, Simeon. Uh, if any of you have ever had a chance to meet him, he is a rascal by all means. Uh, he is a runner and a gunner. He will push the limits of all things at all times, and then he'll act like he doesn't know what's going on. Uh, and sometimes he actually may not know what's going on. But I don't go, hey, buddy, come here, come on. Hey, I just want to build some more trust with you. Come here, let's, let's just, hey, why'd you do it? Simeon, don't do that. Dad says no. It's a command, right? And now here's, and I hope, I hope that my son and I build trust, but that's not where we start. We start with obedience, Son, I'm your father. This is the role God put me in. I'm asking you to obey. Are you willing to accept this morning that God is the Lord of your life and you have to obey him at his word? 
He does not need to come down from heaven and explain himself to you. But instead, he sits, I'm an imperfect earthly father. He is a perfect heavenly father. And when he says, go therefore and make disciples and do it this way, you better believe all 11 heard, not to mention the teaching that went on 40 days before that, all things pertaining to the kingdom, you better believe they lived it out. And that is why we sit in these seats today and worship God with such clarity and unity because of obedience to God. Now, I don't have time to unpack that, but as we move, the second point, there was a king. There was a king named Saul who was given a clear command to destroy an evil Amalekite king called Agag. If anybody knows how that story goes, Saul did not obey God. He was confronted by the prophet Samuel, and here's what he said. Here's what Samuel said. Does the Lord have as much delight in burnt offering? Because Saul's answer was, oh my gosh, the people, they wanted to make sacrifices for you. We, we were, we were going to put on this big event, this big church event. Everybody was coming. It was going to be awesome. What does Samuel say? Does the Lord have as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices or ceremony as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. Don't don't excuse yourself from obeying God with the sacrifice. I'm on the biggest tithers to church. Obey God. Well, I've given so much and done so much. Obey God. Obey his voice. Because if you've been giving as a sacrifice without obedience, I'm so sorry. You're not worshiping God. I'm sorry. And you're going, what in the world? Who let this guy in the pulpit? (laughs) The church doesn't want to hear this, and it's not popular. God is looking for a heart that obeys him. Not a heart that makes excuses with a pretend God they've made and manifested for themselves. But the God of the Bible. So, I want to say this this morning. Our doubts are welcome while we worship. Our doubts are natural. Sometimes very difficult to look past doubt. I'll be one of the first ones to say that. But obedience is the bridge over the troubled water of doubt. If you could imagine that picture, you have all these doubts and you're looking at them and there is a small bridge and God is on the other side and he's saying, come, follow me. All these doubts... Don't look at the doubts. Look at me. Obey me. But Lord, I don't have time to explain it to you. Today's the day of salvation. Obey. Follow me. So with our third and final point, as we bring this to a close, we read in 2 John 1, 6, and it says this, and this is love. People want to be loving. This is love. That we walk in obedience of his commandments. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. If you're Christ's friend today, if he is your Lord, you will choose obedience. Because he's beckoning and calling with the love in his eyes. I think of that with my son. If he was in a horrible situation, I couldn't imagine the crisis, but if you could imagine the most horrible situation and my son was here and I knew how to save him, I would not spend time drawing his attention to the crisis or drawing his attention. Instead, I'd say, Simeon, look at me. I love you. Follow my voice. Obey me. As I'd pull him out of that danger. How much more so is God trying to pull the church out of danger, yet we're so distracted by doubt and fear and other ideas of what seems to be wonderful and the voice of the good shepherd is saying, follow me, follow me. I want you to go and make disciples. So my question for us to ponder is this, is my heart, is your heart, is our hearts available this morning to listen for the voice of the Lord? And when you listen, Are you already in acceptance that your response is to be obedience? 
As God speaks, I obey. I was thinking about Rich's message and, and even Matthew Jacobs and what they were saying, and really, I think this is the summary of it. It's like, we could sit here all day to try to convince people to follow the Lord, right? But at the end, will you obey him? If I spend my life trying to defend God and figure, figure things out for others, I'll get lost in my own doubts. But if I say, hey, I'm going to obey God today, how loud does that live in our world? That men and women, founded in Scripture, obey God at all costs. Not the government, not the idea of a perfect world, but right where they're at, as they are going, as business owners, as mothers, as fathers, as siblings, and we just say, I'm going to obey God right where I'm at. Instead of seeing obedience as a destination, see obedience as my calling in life. To obey my God and Savior. To love my wife that he gave me. To love, and there's those doubts. Are you sure you married the right one? Okay. The doubt's welcome in worship. But when it comes time to do what's right, we're going to obey the Lord. Hey, well, well, what about this, this situation? Are you sure you put your kids in the right school and there's these doubts here? I'm going to obey God. I know where God led me to this decision. I'm going to go back to his voice and his word and the fellowship of his saints that gave me the confidence to make that decision. Because the enemy loves, loves to play with our minds beyond the decisions we've made that honor God. He loves to meet us there. He's just waiting. As we make a decision that honors God, now the enemy goes, now it's time to play. Now it's time to mess with you and cause doubt and confusion. So finally, this is a powerful quote. I actually don't know who said it, but it stopped me in my tracks. Doubt signals that we are in the process of dying to ourselves and our ideas about God. That is powerful. Man, I don't know about you, but I need to die to myself this morning with some doubts. You see, doubts are just that. They're ours. They're not his. There's no doubt in him. I have crafted ideas for myself about God, starting from a place of doubt. I got to read the right translation that's closest to God because otherwise I, I doubt if I got it right. Well, I, I just got to pray more. If I could just pray more instead of, man, God loves me and he's calling me and I want to pray to fellowship with him. I'll be honest and say as a Christian, I've prayed most of my Christian life from a place of doubt not from a place of faith. And not that God didn't say once again, it was welcome, he came up to me in the doubts. He didn't say, oh, you're getting it wrong. But instead he came up to me, he said, no, I'm calling you. God, but look at me, I'm doubting, I'm calling you. In the doubt, in the midst of worship, because you love me, because Matthew, you obey what I commanded child of God this morning, if you are obeying what God has commanded, would that peace like a river run through your soul and touch down on all the doubt? Say, I will obey my God. I will obey him. He is good. He is faithful. Would you be willing, and here's the call for us this morning as we close with a word of prayer, would you be willing to join me this morning and saying, even in doubt, God, my heart is available to you. Speak what is true, God. Would you risk today letting doubt die in the relationships of your life? Maybe it's doubt in your marriage, doubt in your parenting, doubt in a financial decision or a business venture that God led you to and you're going, I don't see the fruit. And I'm saying, are you willing to take a risk today? Say, I'm going to let doubt die because I'm obeying God. And I'm not saying it's going to all wash away today. That's not what I'm saying. But could this be the starting point for a huge doubt that has led to fear 
anxiety, and loss in your soul. And God is saying, I am a firm foundation. Come and stand back on the rock. Come and obey me. Come and walk in obedience. As you are going, you will make disciples. Well, God, maybe if I can just do more stuff at church, I can balance out this other stuff. No. No, no, come to me with the doubt. Stop hiding in the doubt. Bring it. I believe the resurrection is true. I believe God's word has no fallacy. I believe our hearts are burning for what's true, not just in this church, but in the church in America and in our world. Hearts are burning now more than ever for what is true. I believe we have to respond in healthy relationship and get vulnerable with God. Might this be a moment, and we're gonna go into that after we pray, where you have an opportunity to do so. So remember, going is not the command. Well, if I go to that event, remember, that's not the command, but rather crafting what God has already trusted you with. What is he asking you today to be the craft of your hands? Mother, is it your children? Father, is it your marriage? Business owner, is it the influence he's given you? Fill in the blank, Christian. Maybe it's coming back to purity in your heart and mind. All the doubts of all the past things that have happened. And God's saying, come back to purity. Follow me. Maybe it's how you approach your coworkers because the joy of the Lord might be here, but you don't allow it to show there. Maybe that wayward child, you're going, I've got nothing but doubt. That, that child is never coming back. Maybe take the risk today to view that wayward child with resurrected life, that God is not done until he says it is finished. He knows. Open your heart to him. And when he speaks, obey him. Let's pray. God, we love you, Lord. Um, that's why we are here. Lord, I pray if there's any conviction, might it start in my heart. And might I truly receive. Lord, I pray for the church where there's conviction. Might it truly be received. Lord, I pray anything that was said in my flesh or in my ideas that they would fade and only your word would remain. And God, might this be a moment that we move into to just open our heart and say, Lord, speak what's true. We pray this in the most precious name, Jesus. As a church, we say...